up to Facebook. So it's going to take a second, um, but I'll count us in when we're going live. Um, right, for any new people that got here, I am Kimmy Montero. I'm a programmer for uh, Wicked Queer, the Boston LGBTQ Film Fest. This is the second year that I've done the Queer Person of Color short film program. Um, and I just, I fell in love with all these films and I'm just really happy to show them. And I'm, really, I'm happy, like the one good thing I think that I found about COVID this year is, because there's not many good things, but I have access to you guys, um, a lot of access that I wouldn't have. Um, so obviously everybody watching the film and all the people chiming in today, um, it's a really unique opportunity to just get everybody in this virtual room to kind of talk about everything. So thank you again for coming. All right, I'm just setting up Facebook right now. Okay. Um, all right. Get going? Okay. Uh, we are now streaming, so. Awesome. Okay, so I guess we can get started. This is the Q&A for the Queer Person of Color short film program for 2020. My name is Kimmy Montero. I was a curator for this program, and I have some really wonderful guests to kind of talk about everything as far as that short film program, so we should get started. Um, so what I'd like to do first is I would love to kind of just go round table if everyone could introduce themselves and um, just let everybody know, like a quick reminder of which film is theirs, a little bit about it. Um, feel free to let me know exactly, you know, like where you are location wise in the world, especially if you're overseas. And also just let everybody know like what your connection to the film was, if you were a director, an actor, and we're just kind of go, that way. So if anyone would like to, to start, go ahead and jump in. Hi, I'll start. Um, thank you for having me today. My name is Robin Cloud and I'm the writer and director of Two Dollars. And um, Two Dollars was made as part of the AFI's American Film Institute's Directing Workshop for Women. And I'm based out here in LA. Thank you so much for coming. All right, anybody can jump in. Don't be shy. Uh, hi, I'm Max Lincoln, and I direct Pineapple, which was shot in London. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us, Max. Hey, I'm Oriana Opus. I'm the director and producer of Go Go Boy, and I'm in Chicago. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Maxwell Day. Uh, my short is Outdooring, and I am based in Los Angeles. I'm the writer director also. Just jack of all trades, thank you. <laughs> Don't be humble. <laughs> and I am, my name is Mads Angel, and I am the director producer of My, my Girls, which is a documentary that was shot out in Brooklyn, New York, and that's also where I'm based. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. And last but not least, what else we got? Was that everybody? Victoria, you're just joining us. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, so. which film you're in, um, what was your role to the film, if you want to just give a quick recap and let everybody know a little bit about the film. Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a problem with my computer. Uh, uh, my name is Victoria. Um, I'm from the um, um, Okay. Hold on one second. Um, it is coming in a little scratchy. Let me just check with Sean really quick as my tech person. Okay, um, Sean is on it. So just give that a quick second. Um, all 
while we're working on that, um, there's a couple people that you introduce yourselves, but I just kind of want everybody to give a quick um, reminder synopsis, if you wouldn't mind doing that really quickly. So let's see. Max, you did Pineapple. I just kind of want to remind everybody what film that was. Um, yeah. Yeah. Of course. So Pineapple's about an artist and her girlfriend and one night they're kind of like a little bit drunk and high and the girlfriend decides to paint her face with just some paints that are in the studio. Anyway, the following morning, the gallerist of the artist comes around, hates her latest work, but loves the girlfriend's face paint and offers her a place in the exhibition. And it's about how their relationship strains under the new dynamics between them. Awesome. I love that film. And for anybody that is not familiar with the really art scene in any city, it was funny because it's true, it was actually dead on. And I've been to enough like late night Bushwick art loft parties to know that. So that was spot on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just really quickly, Mads, um, can you just remind everybody what your film, like just kind of reintroduce yourself really quickly and just synopsis reminder, everybody about your film. Definitely. Uh, so Where My Girls is a documentary. Um, it was shot mostly in 2018, partially in 2019. Um, but it's a documentary that follows three queer female rappers based in Brooklyn um, that are all independent, underground, but have been making music and releasing music for between five and seven years. And um, the film just follows their careers and what they do for money outside of music and how they, what they do for work to um, support their independent music careers and how they sort of make a name and a space and a sound for themselves in, in the industry. Awesome. Yeah, I really want to applaud you specifically for choosing um, three subjects that were like really completely different and unique from each other and really shining a spotlight on the diversity that is sorely lacking, especially in the hip hop community, specifically female hip hop community. So thank you. Maxwell, you gave like a synopsis, right? Uh, I said the title, but I didn't really give a synopsis. Yeah, I just do like a quick reminder. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's called Outdooring. It's about a young man attending his uh, nephew's uh, Ghanaian baby naming ceremony. And he's going there with a plan to steal the money that's been donated by his family so he can run away with his secret boyfriend. Um, I love that film. It's really, it's really nice to just kind of get a perspective, like a really um an honest perspective of a community that not a lot of people are familiar with and just kind of um just kind of putting a story behind um really you know when you have to kind of do something that's not like maybe fundamentally right but um there's always a story behind and a person behind every single decision you have to make and it doesn't really define that person um so thank you that film is beautiful See Juno frozen. I can go. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so Go Go Boy is about um, a little little guy, little little eight or nine year old boy um, growing up in the late '80s during the uh, WWF craze. And whereas all the little boys are crazy about these big, strong, macho men, he's a little bit more interested in their bodies. And when he's in his own room, he remembers that he had found a flyer with a different kind of muscular, oily man, an exotic dancer. And so he begins to dance in his room by himself and just enters this fantasy fugue where he can be, you know, his own fabulous self and sort of has the, the seedlings of his, um, his queer gay identity in his own bedroom. Um, and uh, yeah, kind of embraces it. Thank you. I fell in love with that film because specifically the WWF part of it, because I remember um, kind of being obsessed with that the way like my brother was obsessed with it and you know looking back in retrospect it was just kind of that idea of just being able to transport yourself into this like fantasy superhero world where like nobody can really hurt you from me um so that was probably one of the first things that made me fall in love with that film so thank you all right so and victoria you gave us an synopsis right hi no no Okay. 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 Um, I can repeat what I said before. Yeah, so, so just um, yeah, introduce yourself, like the relationship you had to the film, um, and just a quick synopsis of what the film was about, and just to remind everybody. 
Okay. Hi, my name is Vitória Regis da Silva. I'm from Brazil. Uh, I am a black uh, woman in Brazil. I'm very bisexual, how you guys can see here. Um, uh, I am one of the actors of the film Jazz, who is a film about a young black lesbian woman who is dealing with uh, uh, issues like relationships, church, family, and who meet, uh, who encounter the poetry, especially Islam poetry, in a way that we can, uh, she can tell her story. So it's a film about uh, this young black woman who lives uh, in a favela here in Brazil, and who is, dealing with these issues that lesbian black people deal in every day and who think that art can be a way to express yourself and express our story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that film was um, a really nice spotlight on the like Afro-Latina experience, especially from an LGBTQ standpoint. Um, and that was just another film, almost like where my girls was just giving, like finding this hope in some sort of like creative or um, artistic outlet and just showing how beautiful and like freeing that really is. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, okay, so I think that's everybody. So I first just kind of want to ask some generalized questions just to the floor. So um, this is not for anybody in sp like specifically, so feel free to um, just, raise your hand or just chime in if you'd like to add something. So I think the obvious question is we are living in a kind of interesting time um, known as COVID. And, you know, as far as being a film festival, we thought it was really important to just figure out any way that we could not have to, like, we wouldn't have to skip a year because this film festival, were, you know, this is our 36th season and we were just really determined to, we'd already picked these films and we just, didn't want, you know, like you guys not have an opportunity to tell your stories because that's exactly why we do this. So, you know, as far as filmmakers and actors, I would love to hear about, you know, like how this pandemic has really changed, you know, like the entire world that you know of is like, you know, as being an artist or a filmmaker. So I would love to hear from anybody about that. Anybody? I think happy to start. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, it's been hard. I think I've definitely been going through a grieving process. I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but you know, um, you really do give birth to something. I know it's kind of cliche, but you work really hard on something from inception to, to completion. And then, you know, that I think the festivals are doing a great job. I think, you know, like festivals like Wicked Queer have been so engaged and so involved. Um, and we're really grateful for that. But there is something about the in-person experience, especially when you're talking about issues like, you know, coming out, you know, very identity focused films where you want other people around you. You want to feel the audience engaging with your lead character. Um, and, you know, filmmakers want to be around other filmmakers to kind of just give themselves that like reassurance, you know, that they did a great job. Um, so it's been very hard. On the other hand, there is an opportunity here for a lot more eyes to get on our films than you know might happen in an in-person setting. So, um, it in a way like it'll be interesting to see sort of at the end of this film festival circuit, which will probably end around the time that the vaccine comes out. It'll be interesting to see you know how many people really engaged with virtual festivals and and where we go from here. I I know a lot of films are like pulling out of the virtual festivals. We decided to stay in um, partly because it's just for us, it just feels like the natural course of things. You know, we don't want to make this go on for two or three years. But um, but I hope I hope that, you know, a film like Go Go Boy can just touch a lot more people. Um, and because it's also about, you know, a very young boy, we hope that maybe this kind of a setting will let younger LGBTQ people see it. Um, you know, they might not be going to film festivals, but they can certainly watch it, you know, at in the safety of their own home. Yeah, you actually, I, I was gonna actually kind of bring that point up, but you touched it right on the nose. Um, you know, it's really 
having access to this demographic that we wouldn't have had otherwise, you know, like, because they literally cannot physically come to the theaters. Um, and, you know, like, I would have loved, like, to have access to this film festival when, you know, like, when I was in my teen years and just sitting in my room with a laptop and but watching, like, weird stuff and, like, not actually, like, you know, like, um, <laughs> quality queer cinema. Um, so, I, you know, I think that's a really interesting demographic that um, I hope is kind of getting, um, just the ability to have access to this that they would have never had otherwise. So, you know, you went like, you know, there's pros and cons to all of this. And, you know, this also really just goes out to that demographic of people that just don't want to put their pants on to go to the film festival. So, which I understand. How many of us here right now? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, does anybody else um, just kind of want to talk about, you know, like how COVID has, you know, just really just affected, you know, good or bad, like, their filmmaking, like reality, if anybody else wants to chime in. So here in Brazil, we are having a tough time with the COVID. And in MCJS was the first, my first experience with uh, acting. So after the film, I was very interested in cinema. So I, uh, I was going to school of cinema who become a director, a writer, when COVID came. So I have to suspend my first film that I was making. So it's very sad in this yeah. way. And because uh, it was a film that I was doing all with black women here in Brazil was very difficult uh, and I was very excited uh, with this but in in the situation we don't have anything we can do right we have to stay home and suspend the uh, our work so in here in Brazil we don't have much of uh, incentive in cinema, in arts, in culture. So it's a very difficult period to be uh, work in, in this industry. Yeah, completely understandable. You know, I just, I feel like like everybody else, I'm just trying to remind myself every day to not get frustrated with the situation because there's nothing we can do about it. And, you know, like taking what we can with this, all these circumstances and, you know, like, just making the most out of it, which was really how this film festival didn't, we didn't skip this year. We just tried to figure out a way to still get these stories told because they're important for everybody to see. Um, so thank you. Um, anybody else um, like to kind of discuss any new or, or good, bad experience that we had like living in this pandemic or anybody else want to chime in? Yeah, if I, if I may. Um, yeah, it's been weird. There's been ups and downs like I'm sure everyone's had, but um, yeah, it's been a good time to develop new work. So me and the writer of Pineapple have developed a feature script, which we wouldn't have had the time to have such long chats over Skype um, if we hadn't had the time. But yeah, talking about things like I also work as an art director and I was on a commercial the other day. And it's just really strange just being on set in the COVID world. You know, you can't see anyone's faces constantly. You're like putting alcohol in your hands. It's just a, it's the same shit but just a very different vibe it's um it's weird I'm, I'm curious to see how drama would be affected but um yeah it's just um strange and interesting i agree um like me being a very sarcastic person you were talking about like not being able to see your faces i feel like i'm even more un like misunderstood because nobody can tell that i'm being sarcastic i think that's like been like just on a personal basis like one of the biggest um kind of like challenges i've had but you know, it's just, this is our new normal. So I think we're all just trying to just deal with it the best that we can. Um, thank you. Anybody else want to chime in as far as, you know, like their, their new reality, their new normal, like being an artist living in the pandemic? Yeah, I had uh, plans to shoot like a super low budget, no budget feature. It was like my plan for the year. And then as like the virus spread, I just got more and more sad and I was just like, I don't think it's gonna happen. So I think since then, 
I just recently realized how I've been all over the place trying to write something that I can put out because I'm not as interested as shooting uh, something right now until we can like be in spaces together. Yeah. Um, so I'm just, I think I'm, I'm writing a lot and uh, going back and, and focusing on things. I have a feature based off um, this short that I'm, I'm like really giving a lot of love to, um, which I, I'm appreciative of. And then just catching up with films um, as much as possible. So just trying to figure it out in the, in the, in the meantime. Have you, what's like the best, you said you're catching up on films, seen anything interesting or? Yeah, I just watched uh, Burning, a film called Burning. Okay. Um, it's on Netflix now. Um, and it was at Cannes, I think last year. Okay. Um, I thought it was really phenomenal. And it's like, I like slow burn films um, as much as like crappy commercial films. And uh, this one was like a really rewarding slow burn film where like it's two and a half hours, but it delivers. So that was um, fun. I keep thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, anybody else like to chime in as far as the their new reality with COVID? I think that was almost everybody. I guess I, I guess if I could say anything, um, this is real. I mean, this is a very just just personally for me. Um, I'm very new to the industry, so to speak. I haven't. Um, I made I made wear my girls right after graduating college, right as I moved to New York City, and um, I have just slowly the last two years been trying to get a foot in the door in the industry and was kind of getting peeking a toe in um, right as the pandemic hit. But uh, I primarily I, prim I prim primarily work as an editor, and it was like when the pandemic hit it was like this huge pause that I really needed to like recenter my work habits. As everyone was suddenly forced to work from home, I realized that's what I have been supposed to have been doing this whole time. But then I really realized like how much time and how much focus you really need to put into something. And um, also how much in a way it doesn't, how much time you need to make yourself sit down and actually work on something, but also how uh, having a stretch of time doesn't necessarily make you more productive because sometimes you can be a little less inspired if you're not out and about in the world. Um, so that, that was just, you know, I don't have any like grand conclusions from it. It's all a process, but I don't know. It just gave me like a, a good sense of perspective of really how much, how much work this, this industry is and how much you have to really like love what you're doing. And yeah. And to me, I mean, I feel like it's, it, it seems worth it. It made me, I sort of like realize that it's, it's worth it and it's worth pursuing. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a really interesting point. Like, actually, now that you're saying that now I'm kind of like wondering if, you know, like, have, you know, like what kind of perspectives we're going to see, like maybe like next year or the year after, I'm like, are we just going to see like a ton of films about like solitude and depression? <laughs> like, is that's what like the world we're living in. Like, that's like the art that like is kind of cr coming out of like our circumstances right now. Yeah, and no I think some scenes. people definitely do. Hmm? Sorry. Oh no, I was just. I think some people definitely do get inspired by a like sort of like forced solitude and time to reflect on things, um, and that's fine. But also, I don't know. I think it's at the very beginning of the pandemic. I saw so much stuff online of just like this is the time to finish your project, and kind of like a lot of pressure. A lot of people, I felt a lot of pressure to put on myself to like finish this, that, and the third, like. But you know, it's it's the same as always. I kind of started a new, lots of ideas thrown out there, and I was like, you know what? That's that's the process. No matter if I'm stuck inside or my, if I'm out and about. So, um, no, I'm not going to put pressure on myself to make the, the trapped in the in the in the bedroom uh, <laughs> short film or anything like that. Uh, Max, would you say something? <laughs> Max, no, like I was just I was no, I was just saying um and no crowd scenes, um yeah. of future films, <laughs> but um. Yeah, it's hard to interject jokes on uh, Zoom, but no worries. Yeah, like, that's actually, you know, like, something I was curious about. Because um, I know not every film has just kind of come to, like, a complete full stop. So, like, how, if there was, like, a way around it, like, how, how would you be able to shoot, like, crowd scenes or, like, scenes where obviously, like, more than two people or, like, that can't socially distance? Does anybody have any experience with that so far? I 
you know, I do a lot of commercial directing and we've just had to do a lot of rewriting. Okay. Um, just working around that because even, I mean, you can't shoot people with masks on in a crowd because that'll be, I mean, may, maybe in a commercial world that'll like, that'll last for a year right. of broadcast. But outside of that, it's kind of useless and it just looks weird. I don't know if people want to see that all the time. I think people are really craving, you know, a sense of normality. So um, I, I think we we're pretty happy to rewrite things so that we don't have to rely on that. Yeah, that kind of just like kind of touches back on to like, you know, how important, especially in acting, like facial expressions, like full facial expressions, like, you know, you can only like smize through like a couple of different types of situations. So. All right. Awesome. Um, so, you know, just kind of opening the floor back up again with some more like generalized stuff. So I think it's pretty hard to not notice, you know, like everything going on politically on top of like, you know, COVID and just everything else happening, like the Black Lives Matter movement that, you know, I think to anybody, you know, any person of color, anybody that's like slightly aware that, you know, like this, the George Floyd situation, you know, like that tragedy, like wasn't a wake up call. Like obviously this has been going on for a very, very long time, but with this perfect storm of, you know, like the pandemic and a lot of other things happening, the world kind of was forced to take notice, um, which, you know, be that as is made, like it's, I'm kind of glad that's happening no, no matter how, how, like how we got here, it, we got here. Um, but as far as, you know, like that movement and everything um, associated with that, how is that affecting, you know, how you're thinking about past projects, um, how you're thinking about current projects as far as, you know, like the films that I chose to be in the queer person of color program, how is that changing? What are you thinking about as far as future projects? Um, I'd love to hear from you guys about that. I'm happy to jump in. Um, so <clears throat> I'm the director of programming for Women in Film Chicago. And in our community, um, we've had a lot of questions of how to move forward as filmmakers and how to work, um, you know, diversity and inclusion, which as much as that's a general term, into the work that we do. Because as freelancers and as people that work with smaller production companies or even larger ones, you don't always have a diversity and inclusion department in your you know office building making sure that we're all like current and stuff and so i think a lot of people are just you know uncomfortable and unsure how to have these conversations how to hire correctly how to bring the right people on board um especially if you live in a very diverse area like so many of us do um how to hire a crew and a cast and and just a team that reflects the community that you're shooting in and so um, I'm partnering with um, a diversity and inclusion consulting company to put together a workshop that will, you know, invite producers, directors, anybody that's kind of involved in that decision making hiring process in the film and media community to come and, and really, you know, challenge ourselves and start asking uncomfortable questions guided by experts, of course, so that we're not just, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what sticks. Um, and I think that you know, like you said, it's a tragedy, um, but it was, it was time. It was meant to be this way. And I think that in a sense, it's an opportunity for us um, as hopefully like op open-minded artists to, to realize that there's more, there's more room at the table for everybody. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, I really hope that, that other organizations and other cities around the world are, are kind of questioning the same thing. How do we go forward in a, very weird time on a positive note by including as many people as we can um, at that table. That's a, thank you for bringing that point up. And um, yeah, I mean, if anything, I think this has made people that probably, you know, like haven't thought about it on a day-to-day -day basis or were kind of very like, you know, like passively non-racist kind of forcing them to be, you know, like actively non-racist. So great. Um, and you know, what are you gonna do about it? So. Thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, as far as like diversity and inclusion, um, it kind of, that kind of makes me want to kind of like focus on Robin Cloud. So you did $2. And one of the things I really noticed, you know, as far as really researching that film and you was, I noticed that you had a very inclusive um, film crew as far as POC and my, like women and just, you know, like 
checked a lot of minority boxes, which I always appreciate. Um, so I would love to hear about, you know, like, is that something that's like necessary, important for you? How that shapes the way, you know, like your films are portrayed? Um, is that, you know, I just, I would love to hear more about that from Robin. Sure. Um, yeah, that's just an approach to how I work. I try to replicate my life and the, my world. Um, and so anytime I have money or an opportunity to be creative, um, I'm looking to hire black and brown people, black and brown queers, women um, first, always. And that's just how I, how I function. It, it, you know, I'm happy to hear that people are getting on the bandwagon now. Um, because we need more people supporting us in the movement. But that's how I've approached my art forever um, and will continue to. Because no one is going to support us like us. No one's going to give a Black masculine of center <laughs> queer person the opportunity to, you know, uh, just make our stories the way we want to. We have to storm the castle and uh, do that for ourselves. And so that's what I'm trying to do is, is every step I take, I try to pull up my community with me. So that's just, that's just life. Yeah. Yeah, as far as films, like um, out of this program that really resonated with me the most, it was absolutely $2. Um, I'm a queer, brown, gender non-conforming um, human that, you know, has to, like a, pretty much all of us exist in a very like corporate white America world um, dealing with the, you know, like the racial microaggressions you had like specifically like when she was in the office with her boss like just I thought it was was like an autobiography of my life and just you know, <laughs> constantly just like you know like the mental strength it takes Gymnastic. to like you know like constantly have to like pick your battles of like do I flip out about this like how like that's why didn't you understand like why this is offensive and like you know the racial microaggressions like literally never stop especially for people um like you and I so I just I want to thank you for doing that um, really beautifully in like a weird way. Like how can you really portray microaggressions artistically? But it was, it, that film really resonated with me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, kind of want to direct a question as far as um, diversity over to Max Lincoln. Um, Cause I can't help but notice that I don't, you know, like your film, it wasn't centered around like any racial issues, but I also noticed kind of like when I was researching with Rob, I noticed with your film crew that it was kind of, you know, majority um, a white film crew, um, which I would just, you know, I, as a director, you kind of have to put the responsibility on yourselves to show an honest and authentic perspective. So I would love to hear about, you know, your decision to have, you know, to, um, Per, like person, you know, like two women of color as the main characters in a film, and you know, like your decision to do that. Um, as much, how much did you really talk to your actors? Like how much um, inclusion did they have in that process, or how you wanted to portray them artistically? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, Natalie, I'd worked with before on my previous short film, and I absolutely love working with her. And I felt that we created a really good working relationship. And her, uh, her partner, I kind of, you know, I was just open to whomever really. There wasn't kind of a, a direct plan as the script was being developed. And I saw this, um, I guess it's a poem called I'm a Woman. And it was various different women saying, I'm a woman. And for a split second, I saw Sherelle. And I just thought she was fantastic and yeah, I just researched her and watched everything I could find on her and went for a coffee and it just went quite naturally that way. Um, and yeah, I mean, the crew was diverse, more diverse than it might, I, than maybe you seem to have read. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to make it as balanced and mixed as possible. It's just, it's not often feasible, but I always push for as, as much of a diverse and mixed crew as possible to reflect London and yeah. It's how I'd like to continue working. And yeah, I've been doing as much research as possible during this time. And yeah, I want to just keep actively making changes and being a positive ally. Absolutely. I also took into consideration, you know, like London is definitely, the UK is definitely different uh, as far yeah. as um, 
you know, just racial tensions overall than the US, so that wasn't... <laughs> yeah, no, we've, we've like, got our own problems like, though. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got a whole load of problems here too. It's just, it's just it's um, slightly, slightly dressed differently. Yes. Yeah. And so kind of like continuing on with that, um, it was... So Mads, um, kind of like similar question, I, I'm always just curious as to, you know, the decision and um, just whatever kind of um, thinking goes into, you know, you being not a person of color, but having the focus on, especially like women of color and in this film specifically, women of color and hip hop, just what was, what was the thought process behind wanting to focus on these minority groups? Yeah, um, so I, so I was gonna say earlier, like with everything that's been, um, so it's been, it's been about two years since, a little over two years since like the inception of the film as a, just from the initial pre-production and reaching out to artists to participate. Um, and the film, I actually, that whole process started because as I was a senior in college, there was a, um, the college I went to announced that there'd be a new documentary grant um, offered that year to film, film to, or to fund documentaries. And it was open to people who were about to graduate. Um, and so, you know, I thought, I thought it might be an interesting opportunity, even though initially documentary wasn't sort of like, I'm more of a writer than a documentarian, but um, uh, I was actually a history major in college. And um, I was a history major in college and I had been studying, I had been writing my thesis on, <laughs> it's not to go like too deep into it. I wrote my thesis on how immigration laws in the United States and their effects on migrations from the Caribbean affected and had their impact on the birth of hip hop in New York City. So it was a lot of reading and writing about the birth of hip hop and like the current cultural currents behind it. But in my thesis, it spoke, um, not in my thesis, but in my research, I was learned a little bit about why women have been excluded in the hip hop movement from the beginning. And on, in large part, it was because it, it's a it's a art that was born on the streets and especially in the 70s and 80s the streets were not a place for little girls or young women to just really be out on their own um for safety parents would keep them home a lot of times um that aside that was sort of that was sort of what was on my mind at the time of this opportunity came along so i decided to reach out and you know there there's definitely white or non-black female artists and female queer artists in the hip hop community, but it is primarily a black art. So I did just, you know, it was pretty easy for me to focus on that. Um, something that I've been thinking about from the beginning of, so like me being a white woman, uh, that was something that I had to consider from the very beginning of it, because it's not just, um, in a way documentary is like a little bit easier to show the subjects in their own light, it's their words. There's almost, there's no narration of my own in the film. I just wanted to use it strictly theirs, their stories, um, their words, um, and be true true to their stories. But, um, you know, I was fortunate to have a wonderful producer and cinematographer who were just students in the film program that I was friends with, um, both queer black, black students. And they, I wanted to have them on set because I knew I just knew that I knew I would be an outsider coming into these communities and into these people's lives. Not so much the communities, just their lives. Even if, no matter if they were like, you know, had the same skin color as me, exact same background, I'm still an outsider coming to ask them very personal questions and ask them about their lives. And um, it was, it, it, that was something I was, wanted to be aware of. And there were some shoots where it was just me that would, I, it was just me by myself with the camera and equipment, whatever, but those didn't happen until um, we had all established, like, until I, I knew the subject more personally as, as friends. Um, initially, I wanted to make it more of a com comfortable space for everyone, and that also <laughs> partially happened because the first shoots required more lighting and stuff. Um, but, you know, I noticed at the beginning, I kind of had to, as a director, I really had to make sure make an effort to sort of like sit back 
like, A, I'm just kind of a chatty person, but in the interviews really sit back and let people talk for themselves and not try to force narratives onto them. And um, I guess, kind of going back to what I wanted to say in the beginning, with these protests and everything that's been happening in the last few months, there's been this like new wave of understanding. And a lot of people have known that this has been a problem for a long time, but there's, in addition to sort of just the general understanding that there's like a real issue of police brutality in this country, like there's been a lot more discussion I see online about people who are ally allies um, and accomplices in the movement and what it means to do that properly and not centering yourself in it and not so much being an ally so that you can say you're an ally, but really what, what it truly means. And like a lot, a big part of that is not trying to force these, like not necessarily trying to force narratives on black people that white people want to see, not sort of forcing these like, I don't know, there, there, there's a certain amount of like, there, there's just like a, there's just a limit to what a white director can do if it's, if we're really dealing with these questions and like even as much as we would like to, it's, or we wanna, you know, tell stories on behalf of people, there's, there's limits to that and it's a, it can be a sticky territory, but it's, it's a learning, it's a learning process for everyone is an understanding because, you know, you don't want to just say no, like a white director can't tell stories that center black and brown people. So, um, yeah, that's, it's been, it's just been a process, I guess, for me of just sort of seeing how it goes and getting to know people and yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, kind of continuing on, I would love to kind of get some perspective from the international guests. So Victoria um, would love to, are you, you're in Brazil right now? Yes, yes. Okay, um, so I'd love to get kind of like a first person perspective on, you know, like what's going on in Brazil versus, you know, like in either reaction to what's going on in the United States um, or um, if it's any different, I would love to just get some perspective on what's going on in Brazil right now. Um, here, what's going on here? So here in Brazil, we have more than half of the population is black. The majority of the people here in Brazil is black. But if you saw the movies, the theaters, we don't see that. Because the, the industry is controlled by white people here in Brazil. Mm. So for, for example, in the last few years, we don't have any black woman directing or writing any of the blockbusters film, films here in Brazil. So it's a, it's a very uh, difficult conversation uh, here about race because we are majority, but we have uh, several problems. Here in Brazil, the movement uh, similar to the Black Lives Matter is very important, very active. Uh, here in Brazil, um, one young black uh, uh, I'm sorry um, here in Brazil uh, young black boys die uh, every day in a large number. We have a really difficult problem here with the police, the state is, a, for me, is a very different experience than the United States because of that. So it's, it's very difficult to um, talk about these issues here, uh, especially if you are LGBTQNA plus and black. Because here in Brazil, Brazil is the first country in the world who most kill trans people, for example, is the is a is a country that here is not a crime to be LGBT, but because of the culture, the morale, the church, uh, this population is very suffer suffer with much violence. So it's very difficult here uh, for black people and. and LGBT people and who is uh, so for me it's very important that LGBTQNA 
indigenous people and black people, we can tell our own story. I think it's very important that because we don't see that much here. So uh, we see more in the independent industry than the mainstream. Um, but here in the, since uh, the election of our president, um, the, the cinema is very attacked. So at the present, the president, for example, censored a film about the LGBTQ plus people here in Brazil. And they, he say all the things about, against uh, LGBTQ plus people. So I think it's very important. And that's why I think MCJS in my case was a very important experience because I, I can see uh, myself in, in the story of jazz, you know? I'm not a lesbian black woman, I'm sexual, so we, we have a difference, but the story is very similar. And I, I would like to be a part of this movement of black, black creators that we don't be no longer only the object of the film, but the creator of the film that we can be uh, control the camera, writing. So that's why it's very important to me to be close to other black creators so we can be a movement that we empower, that, that we're creating a new cinema here in Brazil. Uh, we have here in Brazil a discussion about how the movies made by black people is the black cinema. Uh, here we have the discussion because I agree that we have a very specific, specific view, but in a country that we, have, we are more than half than the population, I think that what we do is Brazilian cinema too. So for me, it's very important to talk about that. And, and, and incentive more black creators to join us to make a cinema that includes us in, uh, in the screen, but creating, writing, producing too. Thank you. Sorry for my English, guys. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's really good, trust me. Right? Um, um, so that kind of makes me want to kick it over to um, Maxwell, who did Outdooring, because you kind of gave us, a, you're a first generation um, Ghanaian, um, correct? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And that there's obviously a very central theme in your film. And not only were you giving us really insight to um, the you know beautiful culture and traditions, but you did also try to spotlight on the homophobia within that community. Um, so, you know, I'd love to hear more about, you know, like your thought process into kind of what I'm making that into a film and, you know, like in personal experiences, um, and any, you know, like any sort of connections you have with the Ghanaian experience and what's going on in the West right now. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. Uh, so the film is, uh, fiction, I did try to write emotionally from a very personal perspective. Uh, so I want, I knew I wanted a character that was trying to come out to the, to his family and just did not have the right tools um, or examples as to how to do that. Uh, so he's just kind of going by pure emotion uh, without taking time to consider any context. and. I think the character feels justified, um, but I didn't want to 
write my own actual experience, my feeling was that if I'm presenting characters that are supposed to be my mother or my father or, or actual siblings, then I will be making sure that they are seen in the right light because I love them. So I'm gonna wanna make sure they're portrayed in a full rich way that is also me taking care of them that is separate from writing a story about these characters. So I wanted to have, I wanted to change it up as much as possible. So it didn't feel like my life, even though, because they're Ghanaian, it's gonna feel like my life, but the characters, everything else um, as made up as possible. Um, so I, I used the, um, the genre of a heist as kind of my, my conduit through the film. And that kind of gave me um, goalposts to look towards as I'm trying to build the story. So going back to watch it, it feels like I'm reading my diary emotionally, plot-wise, character-wise, it doesn't feel like anything that's, that's close to my experience. Um, and I really appreciated uh, that approach to telling it. And it's something I, I wanna keep doing. I think it allows me to create the characters more honestly for themselves, for the story. Um, and I think it, because the characters are gonna come from me because the story uh, emotionally resonates with me, I will, it will come from me. It will, it, those characters will um, feel intimate and feel three-dimensional. Um, but I've done the thing before I'm writing directly uh, from my life. And at least for me, I found like I was, I found that I, I kept getting in my own way. Um, but as far as, the experience uh, compared to my own experience, I I didn't really grow up with a very home in a home, homophobic household. I mean, I grew up in Texas, and really the culture there was just I you just knew before you knew. Um, so I think I didn't even need to have that much language around it as a young kid. I just knew that it was not cool. Uh, so I wanted a character who was way bolder than than myself and just really wanted to come out in, in some way. Uh, and that was fun to kind of explore the different dynamics, especially where there's contradiction, because the character does things that I personally wouldn't agree with, but I can see how, how he got to that point. Uh, and he also doesn't give his family a chance to really accept him but that's also because he's seen how they've treated another family member who's already out. Uh, so I liked implicating the character in their own mess. Uh, and I just found that to be an honest telling that it's gonna be messy when you're dealing with family, uh, including the protagonist who obviously I have more sensitivity towards, uh, but I also wanted to give them room to mess up and uh, I am very fascinated with uh, family dynamics because I think that is where we get our initial understanding of interpersonal relationships and we will go out into the world and kind of recreate that in our intimate relationships, in our um, work relationships, in our relationships with our state, our government, our, uh, our religious practices. Um, so I, I really like the, the family dynamic no matter what it looks like, feels like the starting ground. So I'm always going back there to like pick and dissect and push and challenge um, and understand that it's it's messy and it's hard and it's not gonna be easy. And sometimes there's not, not even sometimes, there's usually not a end destination. It's just, can we be in the process of being with each other? Uh, my personal interest is with black folks uh, and just seeing what that can look like and what possibilities are opened up uh, when we, you know, approach each other with, with courage and compassion and, and all the things that we're all discussing at the moment. So I think, I hope that answered the question. No, it absolutely didn't. I just wanted to make sure that I know that was a work of fiction. I wasn't trying to say that homophobia was conducive of anything. Um, yeah. and, they, and I was just saying that was just part of the film, the fictional film, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but actually, but specifically from your film, though, I thought it was really interesting that you chose to um, 
the the uncle, that character. Um, I just wanted to know, you know, why you felt it was important to put that character into the film. So he wasn't in there in an earlier draft, and um, the the film is part of a school project, also uh, an AFI project. It was my thesis film, um, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I talking to one of my professors, he was asking about my personal life. And I had told him that, oh, I actually had a family member who I didn't know was queer because they weren't queer growing up. Someone just told me that they were queer and, and it was prayed away. And that was that was a real like aha moment for me, because then he could represent what he fears, what would happen to him. But that character is also part of the family it, there's a um, you know the uncle is there for the event but he's there on conditions yep. so the family will you know partially accept him if he keeps things quiet and that's not good enough for the protagonist and I really liked um, not being very clear and clean um, as far as you know they're homophobic they hate gays like no it's it's you know, family will find ways to massage you in in a way that feels comfortable for them. And usually if you are the only person that is asking to be held holy, uh, uh, you can feel like those you'll, you'll accept those conditions because you want to be part of your community. Um, so I wanted a protagonist who was coming there to kind of blow shit up and say, well, I'm, I'm not going to participate in that way. Uh, here's how it's going to go. And, you know, it's going to be messy. But I think everyone will come out on the other side with, if not respect, a different understanding. And, and hopefully that starts to get the ball rolling to deeper, more honest conversations. Um, so that, that character was really kind of an homage to a, a family member who never got to really be Okay, so my executive director is yelling at me, but I, I'm not quite done yet with you guys. So, um, but what I, you know, for what I would love to hear about is any upcoming projects that um, you guys are really excited about that you feel are important or anything you really just want people to look out for. I would just kind of like to touch on that if anybody would like to chime in about any future stuff. No, but. Nobody has any ideas. I understand it's COVID, but. <laughs> I don't mind going. Uh, so I have a feature based off the short um, that I've been working on for, right. for quite a while. And then I have uh, a TV pilot that was fun to write, but. The feature based off of outdooring, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then I have a TV pilot that was fun to write, but feels very expensive. So I'll just put that in things and see what happens. Um, and yeah, those are like the immediate ones. And okay, anybody else, like, you know, COVID aside or just, um, you know, even like just some new brain babies you guys have um, thinking about the future that anybody wants to touch on really quickly before we close up here. Projects that we're working on? Yes, or, uh, yep. <laughs> um, I had a feature that was in um, pre-production before COVID. That's been kicked down the road. Um, and I'm like, trying to separate like reality from. COVID. I know it's it's, it's like, so <laughs> weird. <laughs> um, no, we we I, my partner and I use this time to develop uh, to develop a new script. Um, I'll tell you one of the things that you know you don't really think about is um, investors lose money during times like this. So all of a sudden, it's not quite as safe. Not that it was ever really safe, but it's even less safe to invest in film. Um, but That's you know, so hopefully. Um, we'll come out of this and people will be hungry for good stories and we can kind of turn that around a bit. So we went ahead and, and went into development for another script um, that we would love to shoot here in Chicago. Um, probably, fingers crossed, like next fall. I wish you all the luck with that. <laughs> I know it's, just, it's a weird time. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anybody else have um, anything they're working on or hoping to work on that we should Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I, um... So I, I, I don't know if you know the straight eight competition where you get one roll of super eight and you shoot continuously um, and then they print the film and you never really see it and you create a soundtrack blind and yeah, it's great. 
Um, so I've done two of those. One of them from this year I'm still yet to see, which is like a, a little bit Wicker Man inspired kind of. Uh, and then the previous one from last year features Sherelle in it again. And it's about a person who realizes that there are three people with the same name as her. So she decides to murder them all to become the only one. And it's called There Can Only Be One. So that I'm releasing soon, hopefully. Um, it's quite fun. I, I've kind of gone in like a slight horror turn. But um, yeah, and just the feature script I was talking about. Um, I'm hoping that, yeah, as you said, there's no funding, but I'm hoping that something will bite. Or I don't know, these things take years anyway. So yeah, maybe it'll be different by the time I'm ready. Thank you. Uh, Rob and COVID aside, um, any project that you are working on, hoping to work with? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm working on like a um, queer, black queer coming of age feature. So eking out those pages slowly but surely. And then I made a docu-series called Passing a Family in Black and White. Um, up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, produced by Topic. And so I'm looking, I'm in development to turn that into a scripted series. Um, and then a couple of little micro shorts that I got funding for. So I'm going to try to shoot those, but we'll see when that actually happens. But they're on deck, I guess, for the next, like the, the closest thing, so. Um, do you mind just really quickly, just kind of speaking about the docu-series really quickly, just kind of just let everybody. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, passing is a um, family story. It's about family members of mine that left Harlem in the 1940s. They moved to Nebraska and decided to pass for white. And then they had um, seven children and never told any of them that they were actually black. Um, until I found them and invited them to come to our family reunion and two of them came down to our family reunion in South Carolina and got to meet their black family for the first time. So it's a six-part series and it's on um, topics. So if you just do topic.com forward slash passing, you'll find it. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, so I think we got to wrap things up here. Um, I just really want to thank everybody for um, just taking a time out to come to this. And I understand it's a really weird time, but I really just appreciate you guys continuing to tell these stories. And if you keep telling them, I will figure out a way to keep showing them because um, they're important. But um, I just, again, want to thank everybody and I can't wait to see your next projects. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.